Welcome to How States Are Future Fitting Their Real Estate Portfolios. This is a series of conversations produced by JLL and NASCA. My name is James Cook. I'm a researcher at JLL, and today we're talking to the state of Oregon about their real estate portfolio journey. But first, let's check in with Pam Goins. Hi, Pam. How are you doing? I'm great, James. How are you today? Great. It's great to talk to you again. Pam is the executive director at NASCA. So Pam, today we're talking to Oregon, which is a member of NASCA. They're at the beginning of their real estate optimization journey. Um, do you have any recommendations from the research that would be of interest to others that are also in that early stage of rethinking their real estate portfolio? Thanks, Jane, first of all, for hosting us today. You know, it's interesting when we were doing our research for this joint project, 86% of our states are currently rethinking their real estate portfolio and what those strategies are going to look like, with the majority of them being very much at the beginning stages of that formulation of that state plan. And what they're saying to us is that um, they need to do this to improve productivity, to enhance the work-life balance, to really bring in and keep employees. They're also looking through a diversity and inclusion lens. Um, it's a lower strain on the transportation infrastructure in the states, reducing carbon emissions, and overall it's just lowering real estate cost. So states are really rethinking that space allocation to support the adoption of this hybrid work model. But we also know that there's not one size fits all solutions. So I'm really excited to hear from Brian and his team in Oregon to see how they're shaping up their real estate portfolios. Yeah, that sounds great. Well, let's get into it. Thank you, Pam. Thanks, James. Let's uh, meet our guest. Uh, today, we're being joined by Brian DeForest. He's the Chief Administrative Officer for the State of Oregon. We've got David Wortman, who's the Statewide Sustainability Officer, and Shannon Ryan, who's the Administrator for Enterprise Asset Management. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you for having us. Great. It's great to have you here. Love Oregon. Great state to visit. So happy to hear more about what's going on. Um, let's get into it. Um, so the talk of the moment is hybrid and flexible working. So did you consider the a hybrid or flexible strategy before the pandemic? Uh, you know, that's a great question, James. Uh, a lot of us in many states, and especially here in Oregon, we enjoyed some remote work, but it was only on occasion for most people. And it was sometimes a treat where I could go home, do performance evaluations, write long white papers, and I could do it without a lot of noise and interruptions. And then we also had a few employees that would that would work remotely on a more regular basis, uh, but it was kind of sprinkled throughout government. Everything was really thrown at us uh, at one time, and we moved from zero to sixty in fourteen days, and it was it was quite a challenge. But I think I think we survived. Yeah, it's certainly been an amazing learning experience for everyone. Were there? technology issues going remote so quickly like that? There really were. Uh, you know, we certainly had an infrastructure that was set up. It was relatively secure, uh, but we didn't have mass dial-in kind of capabilities. And I know dial-in is an old term and we don't actually do that anymore. Uh, so we had within, like I said, 14 days, we were pumping laptops out the door. We were beefing up security. Uh, introducing multi-factor authentication simultaneously with moving everybody out. Uh, and we really had to test our own technology infrastructure on the state side, but also on the private side as well. So thankfully Verizon, AT&T were, were just donating lots of bandwidth. They were donating many, many hours to both the private and the public sector. And we all learned and adapted from there. And what I learned, uh, much to my chagrin, is I'm simply 10 miles outside the capital city and I don't have broadband. And it became evident very, very quickly. Oh, boy, that that is tough. And many state work, state employees, I'm sure, run into that issue as well. 
Um, wow. Uh, so how, once you started dealing with the issue of quickly adapting to working remotely, were there in innovations that came about? Um, anything interesting there? We ended up pushing the envelope a lot by pushing the people out the door. One big thing that, that became just almost crippling was our own employment department's uh, application system to, to apply for unemployment could not be operated remotely. And that became extremely difficult. So we had to secure facilities and drop three, 400 people at a time into multiple buildings in order for them to ramp up to the increased workload, but do also do it in a very safe way in a centralized location where they could access the mainframe. Since then, we've been able to push the application out into a remote world and uh, a, kind of adapt from there. You know, it's, it's great that you, in, it, talk about innovations. I'm going to throw it over to Shannon a little bit to, to talk a little bit about the innovations from the facility standpoint. Yeah, so thank you, Brian. Um, so as, as um, Pam mentioned at the top of the show, you know, we are pretty much in our infancy, right, of reimagining our real estate. Um, so I come from the, the real estate world uh, before I was um, with the state. And so uh, selfishly, I've kind of been waiting for this moment because we are at, um, you know, we're at a crossroads. We are, we are at a place where we can pivot and catapult ourselves forward um, to be very future facing and become that employer of choice. So. Um, you know, for us um, in, in my little corner of the world, you know, we're just like giddy because we can implement, we can really meaningfully implement, you know, smarter space utilization and kind of get away from the state's legacy, like, you know, hierarchical sort of approach to real estate and really use it as what it should be, which is a business tool to support the business. So, um, we're working on our um, master plan right now, which is going to obviously include a lot of um, just rethinking the space entirely. Um, it, it's also an opportunity for us to really tighten up our portfolio like so many other states um, and right size it to be frank, um, it where it needs to be right sized, but then also to expand it where it needs to expand to get to those folks who are living in the rural part of the state. Uh, bring our broadband out there, have a drop-in office, and make sure that that office is, supports the local community. So maybe it's a P3, or maybe it's with a library, or what have you. So really looking in through the equity and inclusion lens um, and focusing on Main Street in rural Oregon. I love it. And we need to get some broadband out to Brian's house too. So He really needs it really <laughs> badly. <laughs> It's so funny how we quickly take these things for granted that not that long ago, it was just like everybody was on dial up and it was just normal. So uh, we uh, conducted, I mean, the state of Oregon is part of the series of interviews we've been doing uh, for research for this project uh, we're doing with NASCA. Um, one of the things that I think you've mentioned in our interview around that was that um, organizations like, for example, the Department of Motor Vehicles were changing their hours of operations. Did you see a lot of that, you know, departments having to rethink what hours they were open? I think every department has to think about the hours that they're open. And we've not seen a tremendous push that direction, but rather a conversation of how do I meet the customer where they are? And, uh, we throw out that example just to illustrate there is no alternative that is off the table yet. And so organizations are pushing the, the limits of, of conducting as much business as they possibly can online. So DMV is going to focus on the online experience first, which is opportunistic because they just installed a new system. And so they're expanding that wherever possible. Uh, we've got other organizations that are looking at which days of the week are more optimal for us? When do we get the heaviest uh, customer flow? You've got even the parks department in their operations are really rethinking how do we need to operate? Uh, and, and again, 
it not just focusing on how can we meet people the old fashioned way, but rather what's the way that we're going to meet the people for the next 10 to 20 years, where they are and best serve them, whether it's rural, it's urban, it's across the socioeconomic uh, strata, uh, just to make sure that everybody can be included when they need the services. So, oh, go ahead. I was just going to piggyback onto that comment and um, part of our strategy on the real estate portfolio side is a um, massive restack basically of the portfolio and try to aggregate those agencies um, with synergies and similar missions. So, you know, it's easier for folks to access those services um, and also to um, kind of enhance the efficiencies between those like-minded agencies like natural resources, for example. Yeah, I think we've touched on it, but I wanna get a little bit more into this. Like, what is the big future goal for real estate and workforce strategy? Like, you know, it's the interview question. Where do you see yourself in 10 years? Like, uh, what, what's, what's the goal, do you think? Shannon, go ahead because yeah. you're, you're the visionary. Um, so the big goal I think would be to, um, well, it's a couple things, right? It's about our people, places and, and our services. So it's not just about real estate. I feel very passionately that real estate is, you know, what is it? It's our second largest expense, right? But it is also the greatest tool that we have to be a better organization when when done right, quite frankly, which um, is not one person's um, vision. I can talk all day, nobody wants to hear that, but it, it takes an entire enterprise to come together and say, who do we wanna be um, in terms of our culture, in terms of our service delivery? So ultimately, I think that we are going to be, um, there's always gonna be the capital, right? There's always gonna be the capital mall. Um, I think you're going to see a lot more um, outposts, if you will, um, to support, like I was saying a moment ago, to support uh, that rural rural component, um, and also to support the work life balance and and um, trying to get to our hopefully employees that are have moved out and um, are supporting that uh, rural economic endeavor a little bit better. And honestly, I think our buildings are the actual buildings we have. They're going to be smart, literally. Um, they're going to be able to function on, <clears throat> pardon me, like a four day work week. We'll be able to like turn on parts of the building or turn off parts of the building when it's not being used. Ideally, we'd love to cultivate within our portfolio, a couple of buildings in the different rural or sorry, the different urban areas that are just purely drop in space. Um, and I, I think that our buildings more than anything won't look like your grandfather's government building, right? Um, they need to be, they need to be a place where people want to come to work. Um, and that's, that's my ultimate goal. And, and that helps us retain a workforce that is, they were born mobile, right? Uh, they were born with cell phones in their hands. This is, this is the direction that they're going when they need in service, in-person services, why not go to one building and hit three or four agencies at a single time? if you actually have to be there live. Um, Shannon talks about healthy buildings rather than just constructed buildings and maintaining that, that, that workplace balance, that life balance, uh, if you will. We wanna be the employer of choice in Oregon. And in order to do that, we need to provide more than just a safe, secure place in which to sit uh, like a drone in the past in cubicle land, but rather, uh, an, an innovative space uh, that inspires people to create the state of their dreams and, and what do they want to Oregon to look like and how can they better interact uh, with the customers. We want to reduce the, the level of commuters that are out on the road. And if we can do that, and you know, this is where Dave can jump in. And I know we'll probably segue over into the sustainability topic, but if there's a way that we can reduce uh, the number of commuters by 10 to 20%, you know, that's, that's a pretty good side benefit. Yeah. Let's, let's get into it. I mean, how closely aligned are the sustainability goals here with 
your workplace and your real estate strategy? Go ahead, Dave. Okay. Um, well, uh, you know, I work really closely with both Shannon and Brian. Uh, sustainability is really integral to all that we do in our portfolio and um, across the enterprise. Like many states, we have our own goals around um, carbon emissions reductions and energy efficiency. Um, you know, during this uh, time, uh, we've had a lot of aha moments from a sustainability lens as well in terms of you know, reduced paper use, you know, we've seen reduced water consumption, reduced waste in our buildings, you know, some of that has shifted home. But I think really the big thing that we've seen is that reduced, uh, reduced commuting and re reduced travel time, and that people can spend more time at home, they don't have to commute and uh, don't have to spend money on, on gas. And, you know, in Oregon, our transportation sector is our biggest source of our greenhouse gas emissions. And so, before the pandemic, we had done a commute survey and we had about 4% of people um, who were telecommuting uh, in our Salem um, offices. And that jumped obviously to well over 30%. Um, when you consider that a, a conventional car driving from Portland to Salem, our capital, generates about 100 pounds of carbon emissions per trip. And you multiply that, you know, uh, extrapolate that out to commuters and uh, across our enterprise, that is a lot of carbon emissions reduction. And so we can be part of the solution, um, not only in our fleet, um, but also in helping our employees reduce uh, emissions and be uh, contributing to our overall carbon reduction goals in Oregon. Fantastic. So we got a big ambitious plan here. What is the strategy for achieving buy-in from all of your many different stakeholders? This is actually the easier part for us. Legislators are excited about the prospect of reducing our footprint, and that will probably take five, eight, ten years in order to reduce based on, I mean, to, to Shannon's point that she's made on several occasions, it's a Tetris game to shift agencies from spot to spot and to maximize the use of the space, and that will take time. Uh, my boss uh, is the, the chief operating officer for the state, and she's very excited at the prospect of closing a couple of buildings down one day per week. So my agency, the Department of Admin Services, has two primary buildings. One of them can be closed on Monday. The other one can be closed on Friday. State government is still open like it has been for the last 15 months. It's just in a remote status on those two particular days. And we have the potential to save 15% in our fuel costs because we're not heating and we're not cooling the building and we're coupling it with a weekend. And we've learned that lesson from the state of Utah you know, where they've been experienced, experimenting with this uh, on occasion. We've also got some exciting innovations over at Business Oregon where they've got a project called Main Street Oregon where, to, to again, to Shannon's point, we can have drop-in space for multiple state agencies in that wherever the employee lives, there should be an outpost close to them where they can go in. If they absolutely have to print something, they can go in there. It's a leased printer that is accessible with, with high security, accessible to essentially any state employee, um, and, and they can do their business right there. It's also an outpost, should we have another emergency? I don't know if you how much you know about Oregon, but we, you know, we lived this pandemic like everybody else. And then we lived a bunch of wildfires and then we had a winter ice storm. Each one of them individually can be crippling, but because we adapted to this environment, there were no snow days to speak of. And so business was able to keep on going and we were better able to serve Oregon, excuse me, Oregonians at that point. So interesting. Uh, now that we have the technology, the idea of the snow day, getting off on a snow day, it kind of disappears. Um, well, let's bring in another voice. I want to welcome to the conversation one of my coworkers, uh, Bob Hunt, uh, works with me at JLL. Bob is the um, Managing Director of Public Institutions. So, Bob, you work with state governments uh, and other groups addressing their workplace issues. So we thought you'd be a great person to invite to the conversation. Conversation, Welcome, Bob. Great. Thank you, James. I'm happy to be here. So let's uh, go big picture. We've been talking specifically about Oregon. 
Let's talk about other states in a similar place. What advice would you give them when they're starting out on this journey? Well, part of it would be to listen to this Oregon podcast, because I think Brian and Shannon and Dave are hitting on some of the big things that uh, I, I think what you would want to pay attention. And again, it's not easy work taking a multi-million square foot portfolio and trying to reimagine it uh, both in, in, in the process, reimagining how people work, how they communicate, how they use technology. Uh, but I think there's five principles that are pretty important, and some of them have already been alluded to. The first one is know what you're what you're trying to do in the first. What are we trying to accomplish through this thing? You know, let's not just do a big study without clear goals. And, and I really, you know, everyone talks about the triple bottom line. I, I've already heard a quadruple bottom line of potential uh, wins the state would like to get. Employer of choice. You know, how do we use our facilities and our work model to attract and retain the best talent, regardless of where it may be in the state? Uh, the other one is, you know, you're, one of the big findings for many states through this experience was that in some ways, some of the people were actually more productive uh, on certain tasks than they had been the way they were coming to the office. And I think that that had a rare change in mid-management perceptions about remote work is and opens people's mind to be open to a change, which I think is critical in a change. Uh, the other one that Dave was talking about is reduced carbon footprint. You know, this is a tremendous opportunity uh, through less stress on buildings and infrastructure and road uh, use of roads to reduce the footprint. And the other one, for Shannon's point, is ultimately you're likely to shrink your real estate footprint and there's cost savings involved in that. And there are other things beyond it. So there's many benefits, but you want to clearly articulate for your plan, what are the key things that you're going to do and how are you going to measure them? How are you going to measure success at the other area? And then you got to go back to, well, know where you are. What do we know about our existing portfolio? What do we know about our existing practices? What's the state of our technology? Because you have to have understand the starting point and the gap between where you're trying to get because the plan should really be about developing the most viable scenario to bridge that gap, which uh, as Brian said, is gonna take a number of years to actually fully implement. Uh, and I think the other two key things is you wanna have a thought holder, stakeholder management. This is a profound change in work, a profound change in how people do things. We have this wonderful opportunity because everyone's had to experience it through COVID, but now to look at it in a sustainable way really is going to involve, particularly for a government, strong stakeholder engagement, getting other people on the bandwagon with you in this journey, uh, and also being able to mitigate the naysayers because there always are them. Uh, and then the other really important part, and, and I think Shannon talked about, what was it, the the Main Street Oregon, or maybe Brian did, is realize that you can get a lot of great thinking, but no one knows what the perfect solution is because it's so new. So look at every event you do as a pilot to learn from. So when you do your first restack or your first building area, do a pre-occupancy survey, talk to people, do a post-occupancy survey, put metrics around it and really learn so you have this process of continual learning as you go move forward. And, and I think it's encouraging because many of these things are all talked about. But I think that if you follow those five steps, you're going to be in pretty good shape. It's going to be hard work. But I think as we've heard on this call, it really profoundly offers a, a more exciting and better future on a number of ways. And so it's exciting to hear. So thanks, James. Yeah. Bob, what is the biggest obstacle that you see states facing? Um, I, it sounds to me it might be stakeholder buy-in, but what is it? Uh, I, I think it's stakeholder buy-in for sure. Uh, it's also having an integrated process because this isn't just about changing space or getting a new piece of technology. It also involves human factors and new ways of managing and new ways of thinking about work and new metrics. And often those that, that three-legged stool of people, place, and technology operate in different silos. And so you really need to try and take an integrated approach to the solution, which is new for many, many organizations, not only in the public sector, but in the private sector as well. Um, I think the other one is often it takes money to make money. And, and, and getting to the solution requires investments. Uh, which require business cases. And I think that there are often great business cases to move, but ultimately you've got to get the governor and the legislature behind you because you may have to spend $30 million to save $100 million. Uh, and so I know that 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 component in how appropriations work 
is important. And I think that's where for many states, time is of the essence, because right now you've got everybody going, wow, the change happened, the changed work, we survived, what should we do differently? That will fade into other priorities, uh, particularly in government, give it a year or two years. And so I think the fact that uh, the state's jumping on it and saying, hey, we're going to move now is really prudent because it's the greatest time, I think, to get legislative support behind it. So I've got one last question I want to ask to the folks at State of Oregon. Um, what's something that you learned? And I'll just open this up to anybody who wants to answer something you've learned in the past year or so, some good piece of advice you could pass on. Wow, there's only about a thousand different <laughs> lessons that we learned. Pick one. <laughs> uh, I, I think, I think trusting employees and listening to the front line, you get some of the best, most innovative and cost effective solutions uh, possible. And uh, I'll brag on, on my team right now. Uh, I handed Shannon an assignment in conjunction with Debbie Dennis, our chief procurement officer. And I simply said, run with it and uh, get back to me later. And they did some amazing things. So in the moment, in it, when you have to be innovative, don't try to solve it yourself, but rely on those around you and you will have, they will just simply come up with amazing ideas. I'll, I'll jump in real quick um, from a sustainability standpoint. I think I've seen uh, our ability to be super resource efficient um, during this past year. And as an example, you know, I personally at home in my office, home office, I've printed probably five sheets of paper in the past year. I haven't used any office supplies. Um, we've gone paperless on all these things that we used to use paper for, and we were forced to go to a paperless process. And lo and behold, it's worked fine, at least from my perspective. So I think we can do a lot more with less and you know that affects us in our energy use, our procurement and all sorts of areas. Yeah, that's great. Shannon, any <laughs> learnings to pass on? You know, I think um, for me, the biggest realization kind of to, to Brian's point is, um, is, is it's a new found appreciation for colleagues and coworkers both, you know, up and down the organizational chart. Um, you know, this has brought out the best in people, right? And the worst too, but you know, in terms of like supporting each other through this unbelievable year that we had, um, it just really reinforces that um, I think for us, the culture change piece is absolutely, absolutely possible um, because it, it was really refreshing to know we're really all like-minded. And I don't know that that would have surfaced if we would have just been, you know, going on in our daily bloody bloody blue like we were before. Um, but yeah, trial by fire is, has been, I think an incredible growing experience for all of us. And, I'm, and I think has positioned us perfectly to go into the next iteration of the state of Oregon, personally. That is a great note to end it on. Um, thank you so much, Brian, Dave, Shannon, and Bob for joining me today. Thank you for having us. Thank you. All right. So uh, this has been a discussion with the state of Oregon about their real estate uh, workplace journey. This is just one of several video podcasts based on a research partnership between JLL and NASCA. So if you want more research and information about NASCA, the place to go is their website, nasca.org. If you're looking for more insights about changing workplace environment, check out our website, which is jll.com. I wanna give a special thanks to Kristen Halbeth at JLL who conducted the research that went into this study. And uh, my name is James Cook. Thank you for joining us. <music>